I rise tonight to speak about a very troubled time in my life and in this body. I didn't think this moment would arise in my tenure here in the United States Senate. But tonight I'm very troubled about being a member of this body. Just a few short months ago, we told the American people in our Foreign Relations Committee that we could work together. We unanimously passed a bill that gave this body, the U.S. Congress, a right that the President and his administration had denied us by not allowing this to be treated as a treaty. And yet here we stand today, even though after a unanimous bill came out of that committee and 98 senators voted for us to get a look at this deal and to vote on this deal, we sit here tonight without the ability to tell people back home that we will in fact have a vote on this deal. I find that terribly, terribly troubling. As a matter of fact, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed. The people back home deserve better than this body is providing. There is bipartisan opposition to this deal. There are good Democrats who in their deep conscience are going to oppose the president. I respect that. But there is not bipartisan support for this deal. There's a huge difference. Only one group in this body is supporting this president's deal with Iran. I'm troubled by that. I applaud Senator Cardin, the ranking member of the Foreign Relations Committee. I applaud Senator Corker as the chairman of that committee. Under their leadership, we got to this point. Without this deal, without a vote, we wouldn't even be sitting here tonight. We would already be implementing this deal. And we would have told the American people, yes, we don't have the constitutional balance between the United States Senate and the House of Representatives and the legislative branch that the Constitution calls for. We gave up. Well, here we are. And I'd like to, for every member of this body who's going to vote for this deal to answer the people back home, how does this make the world safer for their children and their children's children? Mr. President, in your business career and in my business career, we've seen a lot of deals. We've negotiated a lot of deals. And the way I look at deals is you, you try to evaluate what both sides get in a deal. So let's look at this from that perspective. First of all, Iran gets a windfall for bad behavior. They've got 30 years of noncompliance with NPT requirements. And here we are, the first thing we're going to do is give them a windfall, somewhere between 60 and $150 billion. Now we know, by the administration's own admission, that we can depend on some of that money. Last year, $6 billion went to terrorist support around the Middle East and other parts of the world from Iran. Iran last year spent $17 billion supporting their own military. That puts this windfall in perspective. One of the first things Iran did when they announced this deal, when the administration announced this deal, is they sent representatives to Moscow. Does it take much imagination to see that their behavior is not going to change in this deal just because we give them a windfall? As a matter of fact, we're encouraging bad behavior. Second, I'd like to know where our four American hostages are. They get to keep them. The third thing, Iran gets to enrich. This is my biggest problem. I've said it many times. My biggest problem with this deal is that we gave up the ability right off the bat to stop Iran from enriching. To me, this is the fundamental problem in this deal. Breakout without enriching capabilities is two to three years, not two to three months like this deal provides. As a matter of fact, the president himself said, this deal, after 13 years, allows Iran to have a breakout period that's basically zero. Who are we kidding here? And after 15 years, all bets are off. So what we've done is provided a pathway to enriched uranium, and I find that very troubling. Unlike many other countries who have civil nuclear programs that are peaceful and are not allowed to enrich, We've allowed this bad actor to step up and be treated like countries like Germany, Japan, Holland, Brazil, Argentina. I find that very troubling. Number four, they get access to the world's arm market in just five short years. What is, why is that important? That's important because of their support of terrorism, but also, more importantly, it gives them access 
to a nuclear weapons capability through technology available only through the arms market. Number four, after eight short years, they get access to the intercontinental ballistic missile technology. Now, why in the world does a rogue nation like Iran, who says that they only want a civil nuclear program for power generation, why in the world, in the 11th hour, does this administration and our negotiators give up and give them the right to have access after eight short years to ballistic missile technology? They currently have a missile that has a 1,200 mile range. That, is very e that very easily brings Israel and Eastern Europe into range. If they have access in eight years to ballistic missile technology, their only intent can be to have a missile that can deliver a missile armed with a nuclear warhead to Washington, D.C. and points beyond. I find that very troubling. Number five, Iran gets access to technology for centrifuges. This is the most unbelievable thing. Not only do they get to keep every centrifuge, they're not destroying one centrifuge. 19,000, they get to keep 5,000 or so active. They don't have to destroy any one. But I agree with Senator, what Senator Langford just said, and that is this. They have antiques right now. What we are allowing them to do is to trade up to modern technology and IR-6 and IR-8 centrifuges. There's only one reason for that. It shortens the time for them to develop enough fissile material to have a nuclear weapon. Six, Iran gets to limit and delay inspectors. This is only important because we allow them to enrich. Don't miss that. But what we've done is allow them to dictate the inspection protocol. I've never seen a deal where that was allowed. Honest to goodness, this, this to me is unconscionable. The fact that we have secret deals, yes, that's important. But the fact that we are allowing them, with no U.S. participation, by the way, on the ground in Iran with the IAEA, we're allowing Iran to actually take samples under the protocol of inspection. The side deals are unconscionable. I would never in business sign a deal where every legal document was not exposed. How in the world? I understand these side agreements are normal operating procedure between the IAEA, IAEA and their countries that they're inspecting. This is different. This is a public, global deal dealing with a rogue country like Iran, and we need to see that. I can't imagine how we would approve a deal, anybody would approve a deal, and go home and explain to their constituents how this makes sense for the safety of their children and grandchildren when we don't know what's in every legal document. Now, what we get? I would argue that basically what I hear, the number one goal from, from this administration is a legacy for this failed president. I'm sorry, but that's the only real benefit I can see. We get Iran, the world's largest sponsor of terrorism and proven violator of past nuclear agreements to promise to be a good actor. Really? That's what we get? And yet the Ayatollah just today, just today said that Israel will not exist in 25 years. This does not sound like a good actor to me who's going to change their behavior because we have brought them into the community of nations. Why do we believe the word of a nation that has been a revolutionary pariah since 1979? Have we forgotten that 52 United States American citizens for 444 days were held hostage in Tehran? Members of our embassy just 35 short years ago. This is the same regime. These are the same clerics, the same mentality that created that situation. We just now have entered into the most devastating foreign policy agreement in my lifetime, maybe in the history of the United States. No deal that I can read in history puts the United States in more jeopardy going forward than this nuclear deal with Iran. Under this deal, we get an Iran that will continue its bad behavior. I think that's easy to predict. Their sponsorship of terror continues. Their human rights violations have worsened even during the negotiations, Mr. President. They continue to back, Assad, to back Assad's murderous regime in Syria, which is the source of one of the most devastating humanitarian crises of the 21st century that's just now coming to light. You and I, Mr. President, made a trip along with the leader just a few months ago. We sat in Jordan and we listened to the plea of those people over there who are receiving refugees. They were telling us how serious this plight is. And now the media has picked up on it and you see the devastating impact 
of what's going on in the Middle East. This deal is a manifestation of a much bigger problem. This president has failed in this foreign policy requirement that the executive branch has given in our Constitution. And this is just a manifestation of a bigger failure, but it is devastating to the future security of our kids. Today, Iran has a national holiday called Death to America Day. As a matter of fact, one of the hostages, one of the four hostages just this year, earlier this year, was moved from the second worst prison in Iran to the worst prison in Iran. And guess what day he was moved on? Death to America Day. I find that insulting. Mr. President, as we just heard, there are three things. I have a little different look at what a country needs to have a nuclear weapon. First of all, I'm an engineer, so this will be very pedantic, and I'll be very careful with this. But quickly, a country needs three things. First of all, they have to have fissile material. We allow this in this deal. There's a pathway for them to get there legally. They don't have to violate this agreement. They will eventually get there in a very, very short period of time. The second thing is they have to have a device for a warhead. In five short years, they have access to the military arms community, where that's totally accessible today. Third, they have to have a delivery mechanism. And in eight short years, as we just said, they have access to intercontinental ballistic missile technology so that in basically eight years, if they want to break out, they will have missile technology that can bring a missile warhead right down on our heads here in this chamber. Without domestic enrichment, Iran's breakout period is really two to three years. Again, not two to three months. President Obama has claimed that we could not get a deal without giving Iran the right to enrich. I just don't understand that. These sanctions brought them to the table in the first place. We gave up on that too early. The president gave us a false choice, and I'm insulted by that. People back home are insulted by this. That it's either this deal, which everybody agrees is a bad deal. Even the Democrats today are telling us how flawed this deal. I didn't hear one person today stand up and tell us how great this deal was. Basically, I heard this is the best deal we can get. Let's give it a try. We can't be any worse off in 10 years. I would argue, yes, we can. And yes, we will be worse off in 10 years. It's absolutely possible to have a better deal. We don't need a P5 plus one if in fact we have the determination to make our own sanctions stick. This $18 trillion economy is big enough to bring them back to the table and absolutely get the, the kind of deal that would protect our kids and grandkids. In previous deals with South Africa and Libya, just as two examples, they gave up their enriching capabilities in order to be accepted into the NPT fraternity of countries that are good actors regarding proliferation of nuclear technology. This deal not only allows Iran to enrich, but it gives their illicit nuclear enrichment program the blessing of the international community. The present negotiators even threw in technical assistance for Iran's enrichment program. I just don't understand that. As a dumb business guy, Mr. President, I swear I just don't understand how they in good conscience and without smirking can stand in front of the American people and say this is a good deal. In fact, I don't hear many people saying that. Even Secretary Kerry, Secretary of State, said basically, this is as good a deal as we get. We won't get a better deal, and the only alternative is war. I'm insulted by that. The second thing they need is design for a warhead. We talked about how getting into the arms community allows them to do that. We don't know whether they have it or not today. Iran would need many things, but one thing they need is access to capital and access to global markets to drive their economy. But let's remember one thing. Why do they need all this in the first place? Why did this get negotiated? Because they want a nuclear weapon. The goal in this agreement, according to the administration, was to, not, to never allow Iran to become a nuclear weapon state. And yet, we see nothing but pathways that allow them to do that, even legally. I just don't understand how the administration and a few Democrats are standing up today and saying this is a good deal and we need to vote for it because it will preclude Iran from ever becoming a nuclear weapon state. It just doesn't do that. As a matter of fact, in 1994, we signed a similar deal with North Korea. The president at that time, President Clinton, told the American people that if we voted on that deal, that deal would guarantee we'd never have a nuclear weapon on the peninsula of Korea. Well, how'd that work out for us? I would argue that today we're facing a similar situation that's just as predictable. Looking at the facts, we can see this deal all but guarantees a nuclear Iran. I can't support this in good conscience. 
Mr. President, this is one of the worst deals I've seen in my lifetime. I'm embarrassed that we sit here in front of the American people and actually have to discuss this. This is so bad. It is so threatening to our children and our children's children that we have got to stand up and we've got to fight this all the way through to get a vote on it, first of all, and to defeat this. I urge my colleagues to join me tonight and this week in opposing this deal. Thank you, Mr. President, and I yield my time.